Guys, should I just quit writing? <laughs> just kidding, I'll never quit writing. Welcome back to Midnight O2 Season 3 Episode 4. This is your host, Amy. First of all, I'd like to explain why I haven't been uploading a podcast episode. So outside of work, I have been working with different friends and guests on different episodes, and I'm still working on those. Just give me more time, and I promise it'll be great. So today, I'd like to read you a few poems about letting go, because that's something that I've been working on lately, and it's been a while since I last read you poems, so... I chose different poems on this topic of letting go, and I decided to read them to you. So the first poem that I chose is by Margaret Atwood, and it's called Variations on the Word Love. This is a word we use to plug holes with. It's the right size for those warm blanks in speech, for those red heart-shaped vacancies on the page that look nothing like real hearts. Add lace, and you can sell it. We insert it also in one empty space on the printed form that comes with no instructions. There are whole magazines with not much in them, but the word love. You can rub it all over your body, and you can cook with it too. How do we know it isn't what goes on at the cool debaucheries of slugs under damp pieces of cardboard? As for the weed seedlings, Nosing their tough snouts up among the lettuces, they shouted, Love, love, sing the soldiers raising their glittering knives in salute. Then there's the two of us. This word is far too short for us. It has only four letters, too sparse to fill those deep bare vacuums between the stars that press on us with their deafness. It's not love, we don't wish to fall into, but the fear. This word is not enough, but it will have to do. It's a single vowel in this metallic silence, a mouth that says oh again and again in wonder and pain, a breath, a finger, grip on a cliffside. You can hold on or let go. This is a poem written by Margaret Atwood called Variations on the Word Love shared it with you and a second one that I picked that I'd like to read to you today is called admonitions to a special person by Anne Sexton watch out for power for its avalanche can bury you snow 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 smothering your mountain watch out for hate It can open its mouth and you'll fling yourself out to eat off your leg, an instant leper. Watch out for friends, because when you betray them as you will, they will bury their heads in the toilet and flush themselves away. Watch out for intellect, because it knows so much and knows nothing and leaves you hang upside down, mouthing knowledge as your heart falls out of your mouth. Watch out for games, the actor's part, the speech planned, known, given, for they will give you away and you will stand like a naked little boy, pissing on your own childbed. Watch out for love, unless it is true, and every part of you says yes, including the toes. It will wrap you up like a mummy, and your scream won't be heard, and none of your running will end. Love, be it man be it, woman. It must be a wave you want to glide it on. Give your body to it. Give your laugh to it. Give, when the gravely sand takes you, your tears to the land. To love another is something like prayer and can't be planned. You just fall into its arms because your belief undoes your disbelief. Special person, if I were you, I would pay no attention to admonitions from me made somewhat out of your words and somewhat out of mine, a collaboration. I do not believe a word I have said, except some, except I think of you like a young tree with pasted on leaves and know your root 
and the real green thing will come. Let go, let go. Oh, special person, possible leaves. This typewriter likes you on the way to them, but wants to break crystal glasses in celebration for you. When a dark crust is thrown off and you float all around, like a happened balloon. This is a poem by Anne Sexton called "Admonitions to a Special Person." Here comes the third poem that I picked. It's called "Immortality" by Lisa Mueller. Here it is. In Sleeping Beauty's castle, the clock strikes one hundred years, and the girl in the tower returns to the world. So do the servants in the kitchen who don't even rub their eyes. The cook's right hand, lifted an exact century ago, completes its downward arc to the kitchen boy's left ear. The boy's tensed vocal cords finally let go. The trapped, enduring whimper and the fly arrested mid plunge, above the strawberry pie, fulfills its abiding mission and dives into the sweet red glaze. As a child, I had a book. With a picture of that scene, I was too young to notice how fear persists, and how the anger that causes fear persists, and its trajectory can't be changed or broken, only interrupted. My attention was on the fly, that this slight body with its transparent wings and lifespan of one human day still craved its particular share of sweetness a century later. This is a poem by Lisa Mueller called "Immortality." I thought it was beautiful, so I wanted to share it with you. And here comes the fourth poem that I wanted to read to you today. The next poem is called "The Days Go By," written by Barry Tebb for Daniel Westport. Some poems meant only for my eyes about a grief I can't let go, but I want to. Want to throw it away like an old, worn-out cloak, or screw up like a ball of overwritten trash and toss into a corner bin? I said, it must come up or out. I don't know which, but either way will do. I know I can't write it in a vein of bridge this time. It takes an optimistic view. Bright day stuff, sunlight on, round Hay Park's Children's Day. Are just wandering around the streets, with Margaret occasionally stopping to whisper or to kiss. Now over sixty, I wonder how and where to go from here. Daniel, your rolled-out verse, unending Kaddish, gave me hints. But what can you or anyone say about our son, the other one, who from such a bright childhood came to such a death in life? Dreamless sleep is better than the consciousness of bitter days. I sit in silent prayer and read of Job, the prodigal, the Sermon on the Mount. I read and think and sigh aloud to my silent, silent self. I write him letters, long or short, about the weather or a book I've read and hope. His studies are kept up. I can't say how much do you drink. Is it more or less or just the same? It's your own life, but then, it's partly one we shared for years, from birth along a road I thought we went along as one. Some years ago, I sensed a change, an invisible glass wall between us, between it seemed you and everyone, the way friends hurried past, patting your shoulder in passing, a joke in a pub, the Leeds boy who've maimed good. Then threw it all away for drink. Your boxed-up books, texts in five languages or six, the well-thumbed classics, worn cassettes of Bach, triplets, not garden, invitation cards, the total waste, my own and yours, and hers. Love does not seem an answer that you want to know. The hours, the years of waiting. Gather loss on loss until my hopes are brief as days, that rush, and go like speeding trains that never stop. You drink, I play. You ramble through an odd textbook 
and go and eat and drink and talk and lose your way, then phone, to set things straight. But nothing's ever straight with you. The binges start and stop. A local train that locals know will never go beyond. The halt where only you get off. This is poem written by Barry Tebb, named "The Days Go By." This was a longer one, but I teared up a little bit reading it. The last part. Yep, and I'm not going into any poetry analysis today because I thought I just wanted to read all these poems to you because why not? And I love reading poetry, so here they are. Remember, I'm still a poet. <laughs> I've been writing new poems, but I have been revising them. I've been writing more in Mandarin lately. It's really hard to balance languages. And different creative works that I realized. So my professor was right about it. <laughs> okay. Last but not least, I'd like to read you one last poem for today. It is a poem called "Whoever You Are Holding Me Now in Hand" by Walt Whitman. Whoever you are holding me now in hand, without one thing. All will be useless. I give you fair warning, before you attempt me further. I am not what you supposed, but far different. Who is he that would become my follower? Who would sign himself a candidate for my affections? The way is suspicious. The result uncertain, perhaps destructive. You would have to give up all else. I alone would expect you to be your god, soul, and exclusive. Your novitiate would even then be long and exhausting. The whole past theory of your life, and all conformity to the lives around you, would have to be abandoned. Therefore, release me now, before troubling yourself any further. Let go, your hands from my shoulders. Put me down and depart on your way, or else, by stealth, in some wood or trial, or back of a rock in the open air, for any roofed room of a house I emerge not, nor in company, and in libraries I lie as one dumb, agog, or unborn or dead. But just possibly with you on a high hill, first watching lest any person for miles around approach unawares, or possibly with you sailing at sea, or on the beach of the sea, or some quiet island, here to put your lips upon mine, I permit you, with the comrade's long drawling kiss or the new husband's kiss. For I am the new husband, and I am the comrade. Or, if you will, thrusting me beneath your clothing, where I may feel the throbs of your heart, or rest upon your hip, carry me when you go forth over land or sea. For thus, merely touching you is enough, is best, and thus, touching you, would I silently sleep and be carried eternally. But these leaves, conning, you con at peril. For these leaves and me, you will not understand. They will elude you at first, and still more afterward. I will certainly elude you. Even while you should think you had, unquestionably caught me, behold, already you see I have escaped from you. For it is not what I have put into it that I have written this book, nor is it by reading it you will acquire it. Nor do those know me best who admire me, and vauntingly praise me. Nor will the candidates for my love, unless at most a few, prove victorious. Nor will my poems do good only; they will do just. As much evil, perhaps more, for all is useless without that 
which you may guess at many times and not hit, that which I hinted at, therefore, release me and depart on your way. This is poem written by Walt Whitman called "Whoever You Are, Holding Me Now in Hand." So, do you like any of the poems that I read you today? If you like poetry reading like this, I should do more episodes and pick more poems on different topics and share them with you. I think it's nice sometimes not listening to me talking, right? <laughs> it's still me listening and me reading, but. Not about my stuff. Not all about me. Sometimes, just I want to read poems and share them with you. Let me know if you liked anything, or if you want to hear me read a specific poem or on different topics. Just let me know either by emailing me or messaging me on Instagram, Facebook. I'll read them. I'll reply. Now comes to the second part of my podcast today. So originally, I was going to do a full episode on. Giving people advice on how to be emotionally stable, but I realized, you know what? I'll just start this episode by reading poems to you guys. But here I am. I still listed out seven points that I wrote down for myself. So I'm going to read this and share a little bit with you and with myself. <laughs> okay, number one, how to be emotionally stable is to be clear on what you want and what you need. Lately, I've been working on this. This is so important. You know how I always tell myself and tell you guys in the previous episodes and different seasons on. You need to understand who you are and what you want. And now here, I'm saying that it's so important. If you want to be emotionally stable, you really need to know what you want. This is like small thing from what you want to eat to what you want to dress and where you want to go, as in life wise. It's so important, and when you're interacting with other human beings, I realized it's important to tell them different ways and things in your mind. In other words, communicate with people. It's important to communicate, and this sounds like a of course statement, but it took me a while to understand. <laughs> guilty, Amy being guilty. Okay, number two, if you love someone. If you love something, let it go and let it be. So, in other words, means don't control. I don't like being controlled, and I try my best, you know, consciously, unconsciously, not to control anything. But you know, as an ENTJ, if you if you don't know what ENTJ is, please go back to the previous episode. <laughs> It's my sixteen personality type. I realized I want, I kind of expect something. When it comes to situations and human human relationship, and I realized if I love like any friends or just lover, boyfriend, female friend, family member, I want to let them go and do whatever they want and let them be. Therefore, I could be emotionally stable. Like that. That's why I said that. If you love someone, let them go. Okay, number three. It's important to emotionally detach sometimes, and don't blame yourself, don't blame others, and don't blame the situation. This is so important that I wish I could tell myself this like every single day. I feel like as a somewhat perfectionist human being, I like blaming myself for things that go wrong or go out of the path that I originally planned, and this is a really bad thing. And if I spot that in my brain, in my mind, then I want to change it. So I gotta stop blaming myself, others, and the situation. Share that with you too. And I'm reading this as I, you know, writing them down. As I write them down, and I just think I thought I want to be vulnerable and talk about it on my podcast episode because why not? Okay, I believe you guys will be supporting me all the way. Correct? Okay. Okay, number four. Don't let others take your time and affect how you feel. So this one, I actually talked to my boyfriend James about this a while ago. I was like, I want to solve this. I want to deal with this. I want to fix this. And then he was like, Amy, you shouldn't be fixing things all the time. Sometimes you think people are wasting your time, but actually you are the one who let them waste your time. And after he said that, I was like, Whoa! What did you just say? 
and then I slowed down, and I was like, that kind of makes sense in a way that you can't really waste other people's time unless their time is literally wasted by you. If they're like tied up and you physically put a like a restraint on a person, or else you can't really waste someone's time. You always have a choice. You you should know where you spend your time on, and you know it. And you can always change it if you don't like the situation. You have the right, and you have the choice. Okay, so he also went on talking to me about how I have the choice to not let people hurt me. It's my feelings and their feelings, and it's separate. And I thought that makes sense, but I just need constant reminders to myself. That's why I've been writing these down, and I'm even making an episode on this to be emotionally stable with my life, kind of gain control back, but at the same time not control over. Someone's feelings and how someone decides on something—that's kind of ironic in a way. <laughs> I hope I'm making sense. Okay, I'm going to write these down so when you read them on papers, you will understand more. Hopefully, okay. And next up is number five: differentiate and understand which feelings and emotions belong to who, and those are not your feelings. I talk to him about this all the time. And for those who knew and listened to my previous episodes, you know that I relate with people's feelings and atmosphere too much, and I was born with it. There's no way I could just be like, okay, I don't feel it, and let go. Sometimes I act like I don't feel it, but I do feel it from the deep of my heart. That's why I can write. You see, it makes sense, but it's painful because sometimes it was really hard for me to differentiate. I'm feeling so sad, so angry, but this is actually not from me. It's from someone else. This is like my close friend's feeling, my close friend's atmosphere. It's her situation, his problems, things like that. And I sometimes I don't know why. I just want to take on everybody's feelings, everybody's emotions, all mixing together. And this is so unhealthy. And then I grew up. I talked to different counselors. I talked to different people. Read different papers and books on psychology and how it works. Realized, okay, I need to set boundaries and understand which feelings are mine, which feelings are not mine, and I shouldn't let other people affect directly how I feel. Those are their feelings and their problems, their issues that they need to work with. It's their work. It's their goals in life, and I have my own goals. I have my own intentions. So I need to acknowledge that they're different, and when I when I spot that in my brain, I need to train my brain to rewire, to rethink, to make myself healthier mentally. Okay, next one is don't repeatedly hurt yourself and rehearse those false feelings in your mind. So sometimes there are people in my life who want to put me in certain situations. They say this, they do this to make me feel certain ways, to change. How I want to do to do to change how I want to work with certain things. For example,、um, maybe my family member will say, "Amy, if you do this, this is going to make someone kind of sad or something." And then they want to make me feel guilty, and I acknowledge that, but I feel sad. And then everything mixing together, I'm just like, I'm not going to repeat that again and again in my brain, and I'm going to practice to stop that. And I'm not going to rehearse about me blaming myself. Back to the previous point, I don't want to rehearse me feeling guilty because that's not actually true. And if I can logically dissect it and line it down, then I will be more emotionally stable and happier. So that's what I realized. I just wanted to be. Really transparent, vulnerable, and shared all these with you. That's what I've been going through in the past month, past few months actually. And my last point here is: don't try to change anyone. It's their choice for feeling this way. It's their feeling, and don't take responsibility for everybody. Everybody has their life and their choice, their lifestyle, what they want to think, who they want to be. Don't try to change anyone. Don't think that you're someone who's like, 
like so great. You can affect everybody. Like yes, you can bring influences, like good positive vibes, influences to people's lives, and that's great. But don't try to change anybody. Don't try to force anybody to do the things that they don't want to do. Don't expect people to change because they have their lives and you have yours. This sounds like a of course statement again, but it's so important for me and everybody to acknowledge that it's already hard to change yourself, but changes are okay. Back to previous episodes, we've already talked about this too. I don't even know where this podcast is going, but this is very important. I understand that, and I'm not gonna be okay if people want me to change for themselves. So, I will read all seven points again to be emotionally stable. Okay, number one, be clear on what you want and what you need. Number two, if you love someone, let them go, let them be. Number three. It's important to be emotionally d- detached sometimes. Number four, don't let anyone take your time away and affect how you feel. Number five, differentiate and understand which feelings belong to you and which don't. Number six, don't repeatedly hurt yourself in your brain and don't rehearse those false feelings in your mind. Number seven, don't try to change yourself. I sound like a life coach, guys. Should I just quit writing? <laughs> Just kidding! I'll never quit writing. Okay, I just wanted to light up the mood. So, well, this is twenty-seven minutes into the podcast episode. Hopefully, this kind of sums up why I read poems earlier on today, on losing, letting go, and be okay, greeting goodbyes with different people and things in life. I think it's important, and I've been writing a lot of articles in Mandarin on those too. So if you're wondering, if you're curious, check check them out on my Mandarin account, and hopefully these are helpful. I just also wanted to document these for myself so I can come back and listen to them later and share these with you. If you find any of these contents relatable or inspiring, please do let me know and please comment down below or. Rate five stars and leave me a comment on App Store, and more people can understand and get to know Midnight O Two and know my poetry work and things that I like as a writer on a daily basis. So that's it for today, and thanks again for tuning into Midnight O Two. This is your host Amy, and if you like stories or if you have more to share, you can email me at ahcpoetry at gmail dot com. Or visit me on my Instagram, AHC Poetry, and I will see you next week. Have a good night.